Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Coding and Robotics K-8 webinar. My name is Dylan Portalance, and I'm a product manager at Wonder Workshop. This webinar is brought to you by edweb.net as well as Wonder Workshop. And it's a great presentation by two inspiring women, uh, Amanda Sullivan, who's a PhD and Associate Director uh, for Early Childhood Technology Graduate Certificate Program at Tufts University, as well as Kim Colazzo, who is a former classroom teacher and now a K-5 STEM lab teacher at Robbins Elementary School in North Carolina. This webinar is called Inspiring STEM Learning for Young Girls, Tips from Research in the Classroom. Finally, once you join the community, you can earn your CE certificates, download slides, join online discussions, and so much more. So I'm pleased to introduce you to Dr. Amanda Sullivan, as well as Kim Colazzo. I'll let them introduce themselves as well. Again, my name is Dylan Portland, and I'm from Wonder Workshop. Just a quick word from Wonder Workshop. So we're a K-8 coding and robotics education company. We create robots called Dash and Dot, as well as Q, um, and free apps and curriculum that you can find at makewonder.com. And you can learn more about us in the resource um, list that we're going to be posting at the end of this webinar, as well as um, from our host, who will talk a little bit about our products. But without further ado, I'm happy to introduce you to your co-host. Enjoy the webinar. Well, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Dylan already gave us a great introduction, so Kim and I will just briefly introduce ourselves, and then we want to get to know you. So as we're talking, maybe you can share a little bit about your role in education and what brought you to this webinar in particular and what you're hoping to learn. So as Dylan mentioned, my name is Amanda. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the DevTech Research Group at Tufts University, and I'll tell you a lot more about what we do at DevTech later on in this presentation. I'm also the Associate Director of the Early Childhood Technology, or ECT, Graduate Certificate Program at Tufts, which is a blended learning program predominantly online where pre-K through second grade educators of all kinds from all over the world come learn with us online um, about the best practices and strategies for teaching with new tech in early childhood settings. So if you're someone who actually likes this type of interactive video online learning format, definitely check out um, more information about our ECT program when we send out that resource list later on. And good afternoon, my name is Kim Colazzo, and I'm an educator here in rural North Carolina. It's my 28th year teaching. I spent most of my career um, teaching elementary school. <laughs> so to, uh, shout out to all you elementary school teachers. Um, I started my career in Vermont, and I see we have some friends from New England. I saw an, a Vermont teacher, so welcome to the webinar. Um, for the last two years, I have been a full-time STEM lab teacher at an elementary school in Robbins, North Carolina. I've always had a passion for robotics and engineering and um, integrating technology into my classes, and now I get to do that with all of our teachers at our school and in our district. So we are just, uh, Amanda and I are just really excited to share some ideas with you and hope that you'll be able to take them back tomorrow to your classrooms or however you're working with students in our schools these days. And this is so exciting, Kim. I'm seeing we have preschool teachers, but we also have IT professionals here. And we have middle school science teachers. And we have somebody here from Berlin, Germany. This is really, really exciting to see all of you guys joining us today. And, you know, it's really important that there's so many passionate educators like all of you who are interested in STEM education and are interested in preparing tomorrow's scientists, mathematicians and engineers, because STEM industries are really rapidly growing in the U.S. and they're projected to continue growing. So we need to make sure that kids are growing up able to fill all of these new jobs that are emerging. We can see that STEM jobs are actually growing faster than jobs overall in this country. And within the STEM industry, computer tech and IT jobs are experiencing some of the greatest growth. And just a couple of quick examples, new jobs um, in software development and web development have really been growing um, and they're projected to continue growing in the next few years. So this is really exciting because there are a lot of new jobs for people to fill. So I'm wondering where you think women fall in all of these, this booming new tech industry that's happening. So despite making up around half the US workforce, women are not well represented in the technical STEM fields. Women make up just 13% of engineers and 26% of computer scientists. And this is a big issue. Not only are women being left out of potentially fulfilling and lucrative careers, 
But this is a bigger societal issue of equity that we all need to care about and we need to address. So what happens when women are not part of the conversation around innovation, when they aren't one of the innovators driving new tech and new tools in our society? Here on this slide, you see just a few examples that have come up in the media over the last few years. If you missed any of these headlines, don't worry, we're linking everything in that resource uh, list that's gonna be sent out at the end. So we see things like cell phones that don't fit women's hands as well as men, digital assistant devices that can't answer women's questions as well as men's. And you know, let's not even get started on the fact that most digital assistant devices happen to be female to begin with. That could be a whole separate webinar um, in the issue with that. Uh, and also new health apps that emerge claiming to track everything about the body, but ignores things like women's menstrual cycles. So there's this bleed out effect when there's no diversity in the fields that are driving innovation. And we're concentrating on gender diversity here, but really we need all types of diversity within STEM fields and STEM careers. So Kim and I are obviously passionate about figuring out why there's this persistent gender divide and why there's this um, persistent uh, lack of women in these fields. And we're not the only ones that have been exploring that. Um, for the past decade and longer, psychologists, sociologists, educators, and researchers have been trying to figure out why women are not well represented in these fields, despite all the other gains they're making in the career fields in general. So that's a it's a really complicated issue, and there's a lot of possible reasons and nuances as to why women are unrepresented in these fields. But one line of research that has been studied a lot is the impact of stereotypes. So a stereotype is just a fixed, oversimplified view of a person or a career or a group of people. It's possible that a stereotype could be rooted in like a small grain of truth, and then it's just totally oversimplified or it could be just completely false. So despite all the gains that women have made in STEM fields in the past couple of decades, there are these persistent cultural stereotypes such as, you know, girls aren't good at math, girls don't like math. These types of stereotypes continue to pervade in our society. And these negative stereotypes can have a big impact uh, it's important to point out that it doesn't matter if you believe these stereotypes or not. You can know that they're not true in your heart, but research has shown um, that despite this, stereotypes can still impact your ability to perform on tasks, on tests in school or on AP and SAT high stakes testing, um, in your jobs, in your workplace, and, and everywhere that you are. So stereotypes have a big impact and these negative stereotypes about girls and women need to be need to be addressed. Stereotypes begin developing in young children at a very early age, around the age of two or three. And I'm talking about stereotypes in a little bit of a negative tone right now, but actually stereotypes are a normal part of kids learning and development. Young children are trying to make sense of this big complicated world in front of them and they're taking in all this information and they need to make sense of it somehow. So it makes sense that they're categorizing things and they're putting things into categories saying boys like this, girls like this, etc. And by age five, when most kids here are starting to enter kindergarten, they've developed a whole range of stereotypes about gender. So this is totally normal, like I said, and our role as educators is to make sure that we're expanding on these stereotypes. If there's a false stereotype, we're addressing it and we're making sure to show an image maybe that contrasts that stereotype view. So kids are growing up, not confirming all these oversimplified stereotypes, but actually expanding on them. So in my own research, I found that young children do have a range of stereotypes about STEM tools, apps, and games, and who will be interested in them, and who will like them, and who will be good at them. I've also seen that boys will outperform girls on programming tasks beginning as early as kindergarten when the educator isn't going out of their way to make sure that they're doing an inclusive curriculum that's going to equally reach girls as well as boys. And I'm also seeing in some of my newer research that in high school, even girls who are, you know, have a STEM identity, who are participating on these big competitive robotics teams, they have less confidence than their male counterparts on the teams. And they actually do less of the actual technical work and they end up doing more administrative note-taking work. And they're 
coming into these teams with less prior experiences in their early childhoods. So all of this kind of triangulates to the to the main point, which is that we need to start early to address STEM stereotypes and continue to support students, particularly girls and under, other underrepresented people early, rather than trying to fix a problem later on when they're in high school or, or college. So that's why it's great that you guys are all here. Um, mm -hmm. And it would be beyond the scope of this conversation, um, this webinar today to really talk deeply about stereotypes and identity and all of all of how that's impacting girls today. But if you're interested in this topic and you want to learn more, please, please check out my brand new book, Breaking the STEM Stereotype, Reaching Girls in Early Childhood. It's available for pre-order now and definitely find me on Twitter and social media if you would like to chat more about this topic. But now we want to show you a few examples of how you can do just this start early with kids. So as Amanda said, um, there's a, been a lot of research in this area, and I think it's so exciting that we're all here together as educators, because I think it's important that um, we as educators, whether we're STEM teachers, um, elementary school teachers, high school teachers, administrators, whatever role we play in the education system, it's important that we use the research that Amanda and her colleagues are doing to inform our pedagogy and what we're doing in the classroom with our students so that we are you know, leading them on a path forward to try to change a lot of these stereotypical behaviors behaviors and attitudes. Um, two years ago, our uh, school decided to convert an old computer lab, which I'm sure a lot of our schools still have, um, into a vibrant STEM lab. Our county had um, started off on a wonderful robotics program several years ago, and we were rich with um, robotics, but we really wanted to get more into the engineering and the design process, and we wanted to start early. I work at a pre-K through fifth grade school, and so my schedule currently for the last two years um, has been to be a STEM lab teacher where my students come to me as part of their specials rotation. So just like they go to art, music, PE, STEM is now one of their specials rotations. And so I see my kindergarten, my pre-K through second grade students one week. And then the following week, I see my third through fifth grade students. And we set this schedule up specifically so that um, they would be able to experience the STEM lab every other week. And also it gives me time in my schedule that I can work with classroom teachers outside of my STEM, my actual STEM classes and help them integrate STEM into their classroom lessons and so that it becomes a natural part of what they're doing with their students. They can also, also schedule times for me to um, have their class come in and we can co-teach lessons for teachers that aren't feeling so comfortable with teaching STEM on their own. We do a lot of co-teaching in the lab as well. So um, I wanted to share just a few lessons that kind of support what Amanda spoke about with the research um, and starting our students very early in the engineering design process and having a STEM attitude. So this first lesson that I'm going to share with you um, relates to a book. A lot of the challenges and lessons that we do in our lab relate to picture books. And so um, this was a K2 engineering uh, lesson that we did early on when our STEM lab had first opened. And I have I've started to do this at the beginning of every year with our new students who are new to the engineering design process. So on the right hand side of the slide, you will see the image that we use throughout all of our lessons, no matter what grade levels in the STEM lab. We use it um, in the STEM lab and in our regular classrooms. It's the design process um, vocabulary that all of our students know. It's the process that we work through every time we have a challenge. So we start off with a question. We ask, what is the question that we need to focus on today? And then we go about imagining a solution. And a lot of our students um, do not have a lot of background knowledge to tie imagining to. So at this point in the lesson, I might include um, some pictures. For example, with this particular lesson, they had read the book, um, we had read the book, Who Sank the Boat, which is a cute little picture book about all these animals who slowly get into the boat and it starts to you know, get heavier and heavier and lower in the water. And then all of a sudden the mouse jumps on and the boat sinks. And so everybody thinks that the mouse sank the boat. Um, so a lot of my students did not have experience um, with what different types of boats look like. Their challenge was going to be that they had to engineer a boat and see how many an plastic animals they could fit on their boat before it sank. And so during the imagination phase, you know, I might show a video of some boats in this particular slide deck, um, which is linked that you will receive at the end of our webinar and feel free to use it or edit it however fits your needs. Um, but the, I, 
we, we looked at pictures of boats. What do different boats do? What are their jobs? And then the students go about planning. Now, this is a part of the process that I think we as teachers who are trying to conserve time, we don't have a whole lot of time throughout the day to fit in the whole design process. Same thing in the STEM lab. And we tend to cut this part out. And um, I would really appeal to you over the last two years I have found that the planning is one of the most important steps. And it's, it's vital to the students being able to work on their four C's, their collaboration, their critical thinking, their communication with each other as they actually put down their design, what they would like to see it look like um, before they go to creating. Then we move on to the create stage. And I like this particular lesson because I think it shows that you do not have to have um, a huge uh, amount of money and, and uh, a lot of technical you know, um, robotics for every single challenge that you do. The, this lesson was all done with dollar store items. The students were given an option. They could either choose to make a tin foil boat, they could use popsicle sticks and tape, or packing peanuts and tape. So they had to decide with their teams and, and have those critical conversations about which um, design material was going to work best for them. Then they went ahead and did their plan. You can see on the le left-hand side, the teams are drawing out their plan. In the middle, they're at the create stage, trying to create what they thought was gonna be a good boat, but you can see from his little design that it's probably not gonna hold a lot of animals when you have the tape running in a little circle like that. Um, <laughs> But these are all really important um, strategies that the kids need to work on and get practice with and why we start, we believe starting early is very helpful. Of course, then we um, had to test out the boats in our pond, which was in the STEM lab. And um, it also worked on the kindergarten skill of counting. So as the animals were put on the boat, we counted out the animals and they each got to test out their plan. Um, a lot of times we don't get to the redesign stage because I only have 45 minutes in my STEM lab. And we're going to talk a little bit later on some tips and tricks for those um, to meet those um, problems that sometimes pop up. And so but we always have a discussion at the end whole group as far as um, what would I design differently? How could I have done this better? You know, what would have held more animals? What went wrong? Another lesson that I wanted to share with you that comes from another cute picture book, Magnet Max, um, was when our younger students in kindergarten and first grade were starting to, their physical science lessons on pushes and pulls and just beginning to explore with magnets. Some of our students had never held a magnet before, did not know how it worked. Um, Magnet Max is a picture book and it's a rhyming book that um, gives a lot of details about what um, this little boy Max goes through his house trying to pick up different things with his magnet. And so they get some background knowledge that way. Also, when they went to the um, Imagine stage, we have a subscription to Brain Pop, or but you can find lots of other free videos, you know, on YouTube that would help provide that background knowledge so students can kind of imagine what their solution will be. These again were very inexpensive materials that they were provided with. Each each team had a tray of disc magnets, wand magnets, which I think we purchased at Amazon. Um, very again, very cheap matchbox cars that we got at the dollar store. Rolls of tape. And then we just um, created roads on the floor with um, masking tape and cardboard tube tunnels. And their challenge was to see if they could move their car along the road without using their hands at all. So I didn't give any direction in the magnets. I didn't tell you know, how they were to attach them to the car or even if they should attach them to the car. We just let them experiment and tinker and play, which is a lot of um, what we have found is very successful, especially with our younger kids. Um, and especially with the population, which I'll discuss with you in a little bit, um, of students at our school who don't have materials in their homes and haven't had the opportunity to tinker with some of these things. And then the third lesson that I thought went right along with um, Amanda's research um, goes with the book, If I Built a Car, which Chris Van Dusen, and I know Amanda's going to speak about him in just a minute as well, <laughs> um, has written some very great picture books that are wonderful for engineering. This little boy goes through and just imagines this elaborate car that he's going to invent in the future. And so our second grade engineers um, used materials like cardboard tubes, crayons, bottle caps, and all of these things are great if you send out a list to your parents at the beginning of the year of of STEM items that you need. You'll get bags of recycled materials a lot of times that you can use in projects like this. They were given toothpicks and straws. And um, this particular lesson was kind of more of an arts and crafts type lesson because it didn't involve much engineering. But then we carried that a step further after they had made their cars 
and um, we use them um, with some measurement challenges. How far can your car roll? And they were practicing, you know, measuring in millimeters and centimeters and converting. And then we added a ramp. What changes when, you know, your car has to go down a ramp? So you can stretch a lot of these lessons into a lot of the different um, uh, curriculum that your teachers are trying to hit on in the regular classroom. Uh, we, we also, at that point in time, fifth graders were working on their fo force and motion unit. And so they read the exact same book and they were, um, I wanted them to start using some of our Lego We Do 2.0 kits. So let me just show you a picture of those. If you have not used the We Do kits, um, you see a picture on the left hand side. It's a kit with all of the Lego pieces and parts. And then the software that comes with it, um, it's a free app. You can use the Chromebook or iPad or an Android device. And it's all wireless, it's connected through Bluetooth. So the program walks the students through the building process of whatever um, robot they're building at that time. In this case, it was a car. And then they also have to program the robot to get the motor to turn correctly or you know, which direction and how long they want the motor to run. So there's some coding involved with that. And then they test out the cars um, on the um, floor. And, and what we were looking for is what happens when we change the wheels in the back? If there's small wheels in the back, how far does the car go and at what speed? If there are large, if we change them to large wheels in the back, what, what will happen? And so we did a lot of experimenting with that, all going back to you know this, this um, picture book that this little boy had created his own car. And then the kids were given some free time to create their own car as well. So three lessons that I think really um, kind of show how getting kids to tinker and engineer and just create and imagine things at an early age is a great way to get started. I always love hearing you talk about your school, Kim, and the work that you're doing. It always inspires me because it's so, simpatico with what we're trying to do at the DevTech Research Group at Tufts and spreading such a similar message of enjoying STEM starting in the early elementary years. Um, so yeah, I'm a researcher at the DevTech Research Group at Tufts University. We're an interdisciplinary research group led by an amazing woman, Dr. Marina Umashi Bears. And a lot of people know us for the new technologies that we develop. And that's true, we do develop a lot of new technologies, such as the Kibo Robotics Kit. Um, we co-developed, collaborated on the Scratch Junior programming app that many of you might be familiar with. And we're currently prototyping a new bioengineering interface called Crispy to teach bioengineering to young kids. But we know, uh, like him and probably so many of you, that new technologies, no matter if it's the best technology in the world, is only about 1% of the solution that we need to really foster excellent STEM learning with our, our young ones. We need teachers, more teachers like Kim and all of you who are passionate about teaching with STEM and new technologies, that they have the theoretical and pedagogical background that they need. And so at DevTech, we also aim to make theoretical contributions, do empirical research and do community outreach training and working with teachers like all of you. And within all of that that we do at DevTech, my role has been um, and my passion has been from the very beginning to look at how we can use all of these technologies, all of this curricula, all of these exciting activities and books, some of which Kim was mentioning earlier, to really boost girls interest and confidence in STEM. And I I come at this from a very personal place because I didn't grow up with any of this. I actually grew up with a lot of stereotyped messages about girls and what they could do. And I struggled with my confidence in myself in, in things like math, engineering, and technology. And that's why I'm so passionate about making sure that girls today are, are growing up with a little bit of a different message and they're growing up confident. And so in my work at DevTech and with schools and teachers and consulting with companies who are trying to engage girls in STEM, a lot of people ask me, you know, well, how do we choose the right tools? Um, you know, okay, yes, we understand. We need to start teaching them coding and robotics and get them interested in this. But what are the best tools and technologies to use? And that's it's a great question. And it's one that Kim and I will be answering uh, today in this webinar. But we're actually interested, before we go in and share with you our approaches to choosing tools, we're curious if any of you want to share in the chat what do you look for when you're choosing a tool for your students or technology for your students? And specifically, if any of you have worked specifically to engage girls in STEM, what's your criteria? What do you look for? 
So let's see. Oh, some people are saying they love Minecraft because it's a really versatile tool. Definitely. It's very open ended. Let's see if there's any other idea. People are talking about maker spaces. Oh, yes. Definitely, it needs to appeal to the child. That's the most important thing. It's more important than anything else about the tool. Oh, I'm seeing a lot about Ozobots and Little Bits. Definitely a great choice. Yes. Definitely. Yes, stand the test of time and it won't be outdated quickly. That's so important, especially when you have a limited budget of what you can buy for your school or for your classroom or for your home. So keep sharing because you're sharing ideas with one another and it's really exciting and we'll circle yes. back. We're going to talk about some of the tools that you guys have mentioned actually. But before we get to the modern day tools, we thought it would be interesting to provide some context by taking a historical look at STEM products and tools in, in the US. So on the left, left hand side of the screen here, you can see a 1922 ad for an erector set and a building set. And the whole ad campaign is centered around boys today, men tomorrow, raising boys with this engineering mindset from the very beginning with the play that they're doing. So many people might say, okay, that's a, a product of the times, that's to be expected. So let's flash forward to 2015, this other image on the right-hand side of the screen here. And if you, as you're looking at this image, as I'm talking, if you think there's anything wrong with this picture, please feel free to share and chat about what you think is wrong in the chat window. But this is an image you might have seen. It went viral on social media in 2015 when somebody shared this picture when she was shopping and she was really upset about this image. And there's probably a lot of things wrong with this image. I see that a lot of you are, are chatting about this in the chat window right now. And for me, what is the most wrong with this image is that it perpetuates this idea that building sets are inherently for boys or for men and that we don't even need to delineate it by saying boys building sets. Everybody will just assume that that's the normal correct option. But if girls or women are building and engineering, that's sort of a weird different option. We better make sure we call it out and we label it. And, and it's just a different and odd option that needs to be delineated on this sign. And for me, that's that's just not the idea that I want to share with my kids or my students. And I was glad that this picture got over 2000 retweets at the time it came out and really called attention to this, this bias in our culture. Okay, flashing all the way forward to today. This is a picture that I just took recently on my cell phone when I was out shopping. And it wasn't even a general toy aisle. It was specifically a building, tinkering, engineering aisle that had a bunch of different building kits. And even here in this aisle, we see, I, I took a picture because I was just reminded of this big battle between the pink and the blue aisle and how it still exists today and how, you know, products that are marketed in this sort of more masculine way have a totally different tone, theme, topic that they're exploring, and that it, it's so confusing for parents and educators that are out there to know what they should choose. Will they be perpetuating a stereotype by buying a pink kit? You know, why do all the blue, blue kits show explosions and like angry dinosaurs and no pro-social or helping behaviors? And there's just still this big messaging that centers around gender in all of our toys, but also in the STEM and engineering toys that are out there. But I did want to mention that there are a lot of new companies that are attempting to disrupt the pink aisle and they're attempting to create STEM tools and toys in general for girls that sort of change our mindset on what it means to be a girl's toy and playing on this idea of things that are historically thought of as girls' toys and integrating a STEM twist in them. So these are a couple of products that you may or may not have heard of. One of them is called Ruminate. That's the kit on the far right. And it's sort of playing on this idea that girls like dollhouses. So why not build and design and engineer your own with motors, lights, fans. And I've used this kit with boys, girls, kids of any gender. And it's a very fun and versatile building kit that you can also integrate with other materials if you're inspired. And another product line that some of you might have heard of is Goldie Blocks, which plays on this idea of a narrative and a story and a character and integrating STEM learning around that. So there are all sorts of tools that are out there, the pink aisle, the blue aisle, the gender neutral aisle, somewhere in between and somewhere else. 
And that can often make it even more challenging for teachers, parents, and educators of all sorts to know what they should be picking. So forget about the packaging, that's my advice. Forget about who you think it's marketed to. And just like someone mentioned in the chat earlier, start with what the kids might be interested and in, what you want them to be learning. So we suggest choosing tools that engage girls in creating rather than consuming technology and media. And by that I mean they're actively using technology if they're using it rather than passively using it. Think about programming a video game with an app rather than just playing a video game. We definitely want to engage girls in tinkering and building and exploring because there's research that shows that boys have more experience tinkering in their early childhoods. We want to engage girls in coding and engineering and seeing how fun and creative that can be um, beginning from an early age. We definitely want to choose tools that will foster spatial reasoning because that is something that has been shown that we can improve and practice and grow. We want to engage girls in building and design, like with some of the activities that Kim showed earlier with the planning process and, and then building structures after that. But more importantly than everything, you guys hit the nail on the head in the chat. We want to build off of the girl's interest. And if you're worried about the messaging on the box or the advertising, you can always just toss the box and just bring the materials out and let kids use the materials without showing them that maybe it was a girl's face or a boy's face on the box and the branding. Yeah, so and, and it's been so exciting to look at the chat because there's been so many great tools in there. I definitely want to go through it later and create a, an even longer wish list. My administrator's <laughs> going to be thrilled. <laughs> but I, we wanted to share a little bit about, um, you know, exactly what Amanda just said. Um, when we first were developing our STEM lab, and it's it's a process, an ongoing process. We're just in year two of it. Um, we definitely wanted to choose tools that were both user friendly to both the teacher and the student. Um, we wanted them to be gender neutral, um, and we wanted um, them to be appropriate for especially our population, which I'll talk a little bit more about later, but um, we have a lot of English, um, English language learners in our school. And so we wanted um, to kind of focus on some tools that were going to, to help them, the language development as well. So I just have listed a few of our very favorites. Um, as far as the robotics goes, um, I could tell from the chat that Dash is a lot of your favorite as well. We love Wonder Workshop. And so we um, started with Dash robots in our lab. Um, we added bee bots, um, which if you have not used those, it's the second picture down. They look like bees. Um, they are uh, a self-contained kind of robot in that you don't need a device to run them. They code just by pushing the buttons on the top. Great for introducing analytical linear coding to young students. We use them with our preschoolers all the way up through our fifth graders. Um, the We Do 2.0 kits that I talked about earlier, uh, we use the Sphero robots as well, the little round um, spherical robots. Um, again, all of those very gender neutral, um, very user friendly, they go from very basic um, apps where the students can just learn to drive them around to more advanced um, coding. And don't get me wrong, uh, we have our preschoolers coding, which I'm sure I could tell from the chat a lot of you do as well. So um, it, it really doesn't matter the age level, it just matters the um, experience level. So the more experience that we're giving our younger students, you know, the better they do later on as far as working into the upper levels of coding. Um, we also invested in some makey makey, some little bits that a lot of you had mentioned. Um, and, and then just some um, basic engineering tools. And I saw somebody mention the Kiva planks, which if you haven't used those, they are just very um, general rectangle, rectangularly shaped pieces of wood. They're all the same size, the same shape, but they are wonderful for building and engineering. We bought Play-Doh, we bought um, LED lights and copper tape so that students could experiment with those, um, as well as um, writing some grants to get lots of gender neutral picture books and a lot of picture books um, that show females as the engineers because we really wanted our girls to feel comfortable in the lab from from an early um, from an early get go. Um, so those are just some of our favorite tools that we've been using in the lab successfully. We also in keeping up with um, you know what's new in the research and what we see coming on the horizon as far as uh, the global opportunities and careers that our students will be seeking as they get out of school. We've invested in virtual reality, augmented reality. Um, the, we now have a set of the Parrot Airborne Mambo drones and our third graders 
through fifth graders are, are learning to use the indoor drones. They're great for some engineering challenges, um, as well as learning how to pilot drones. The Osmo devices, if you haven't used those, um, they just help your iPads become interactive. And getting back to what Amanda said, instead of just um, consuming uh, content from an iPad, it allows the students to be creating on the table below and the mirror picks up what the students are doing and allows it to be much more interactive and creative. Um, and as well as snap circuits, because we do a lot of circuitry um, throughout the elementary school years, getting them ready um, for the electronics that they face in middle school and high school. So those are some new tools that we've added to the lab that the students are just loving. So what do you do with all of those tools, right? That's probably what some of you are wondering. And so Kim and I wanna share a few examples of activities and curriculum that you could go out and use on your own. We'll focus on some tools that use robotics kits, but also totally no tech things. And later on share with you some of the picture books that Kim was mentioning so that you have a lot of ideas of where to start at the minute that this webinar ends. So I wanted to share with you briefly a curriculum that I ran at the Healy School in Somerville, Massachusetts. And that's where this title of the curriculum came from, Helping at Healy. It was a robotics curriculum that we did in kindergarten through second grade classes using the Kibo Robotics Kit, which I'll tell you a little bit more about later. And we ran it for seven weeks. Once a week for one hour, I came in and worked with the students in the classrooms. And what this was also a kind of a training experience so that the teachers could see it all happening and kind of co-teach with me. And then the next year they were able to riff on it, adapt it and use it on their own. So that was really, um, as researcher, I never wanna just go to a school, see great results and then leave. And then the school is kind of like, what do, what do we do now? The most important thing is to empower the teachers and, and so that I can learn from the teachers about what I should be doing with the kids and everyone feels like they're learning through the whole process. So I worked with these teachers because I wanted to come up with a curriculum unit that would really be equally engaging to all of their students. And they actually came up with this theme, Helping at Healy, because they wanted to have a curriculum that would focus on fostering positive school and classroom community and to have a chance to address some of the issues of respect and listening and things like that that were coming up um, in their classrooms throughout the year. Additionally, we wanted to specifically create a type of curriculum with robotics that might have contrasted the view that some people had been seeing of robotics being used in competitions or being used in battle bot type things. And we wanted to totally throw that on its head and show a more collaborative, compassionate view of robotics. And that was the purpose of this curriculum. And so we use the Kibo Robotics Kit. If you haven't ever heard of it before, it's actually a robot that we developed at the DevTech Research Group at Tufts University and is now available through Kinder Lab Robotics. And it's specifically designed for young children, as Kim was mentioning, a very gender neutral. That was really important, uh, obviously, in this specific unit we were doing. And it's designed for very young children, so there's no screen time involved. The robot is programmed using interlocking wooden blocks, just kind of resembling a traditional Montessori learning type manipulative. And each block represents a different action that the robot can carry out. So just so you have a little, I'll show you the final projects that the kids made, but let me quickly show you a little demo of how the Kibo robot works. So it has motors and wheels that you can connect to the robot, but you actually don't even need to use the wheels. If you don't want to have a car style robot, you can do more of a kinetic sculpture, a dancing ballerina, that sort of thing. There's all sorts of sensors, outputs, light bulbs, sound recorders, things like that, that you can connect to any of the ports on top of the robot. And you can also program it, like I mentioned, without any screen time using a language of wooden blocks. Each barcode represents a different action for the robot to carry out. And then with just the press of a button, the robot will act out your program. You can do things as simple as basic commands. And that was kind of what we were reinforcing in kindergarten up through conditional statements, loops, sensors, and all of that. And we specifically created Kibo as part of our, our gender neutral approach to integrate the arts, crafts, and design tinkering. And it can really look and feel differently every time you use the robot. So let me show you what the kids did with this robot that we were using. 
So they, for their final project, created robots that would help somehow in their school or their community. So a lot of kids were interested in, um, because we studied some of the real world robots that are out there, and a lot of kids were drawn to the Roomba and these house cleaning robots. So their attempt to help their classroom be a more positive place was to make it a cleaner place. So they created a trash chute robot or a cycling robot that's programmed to drive uh, to the garbage can in their classroom. In the middle, we see an example. There was one classroom. One of the things they were really struggling with was being respectful and listening during circle time when the teacher was talking and giving instructions. So this group created a robot that using a sound sensor, whenever people were too noisy near it, it would shake and it would light up and it would remind kids to stop and listen. And that, that was supposed to be the, the teacher's helper. Um, that robot was really cute. And then another group wanted to focus on sharing school supplies in case somebody forgot their pencil that day or forgot their crayon, instead of saying, you know, something mean to them, instead, uh, this robot would help by sharing and distributing school supplies. So it was really exciting to see kids were really on board with this idea of creating helpful robots and really showcasing, you know, that a lot of robots in the real world and the professional world are designed to help humans and to help with tasks be it outer space, in hospitals, underwater, um, that there's this social, emotional, caring and compassionate side to what engineers are doing and showcasing that to all of the students as well. So what I found before the curriculum unit was that boys were significantly more interested in engineering. And this was sort of disheartening to me. I, I was sort of hoping that maybe at, at this early childhood level, that wasn't true yet, but boys were significantly more interested in engineering. After the curriculum, we saw no significant differences between boys and girls in their interest in being an engineer. So I was like, yay, that's success. You know, <laughs> this work is not about edging boys out. It's about bringing other people in and making sure that everyone has equal interest, access, and exposure to all of these things. We saw that girls had a significant increase in their desire to be an engineer after completing the curriculum. We saw that boys and girls and all students mastered a lot of different engineering and programming concepts and that there were no gender differences in performance on tasks. And we also saw that there was an increase in the percent of children who thought that kids of all gender would enjoy using something like the Kibo robot equally. And I was really interested in this because when I asked the students, so what makes you say that, they really talked about their classroom experience and it really resonated with me just how important positive exposure is, almost more so than the actual concepts that they might have learned. Just having this positive exposure and seeing everybody happy and enjoying it was a big part of the shift in attitude. And so here's some of the quotes from the kids when I said, you know, how did you decide everyone might like this robot equally? They said, well, because we all love robotics class. I learned that from this class. Everybody would like to play with these robots because my class played with one a lot. And when you came to our class, everybody enjoyed all of these things. And so that was just, it really spoke to, even at this early age, how important this like once a week exposure was to everyone. And so I, full disclosure, I'm a former drama teacher before I did my second career into the ed tech STEM ed world. So for me, it's just natural to integrate singing, music, dance, puppetry and whatnot into the work that I do with STEM. But what I've also found is that we need to remember that STEM is not just computers, robots, and drones. In order to reach a wider group of kids who might not be traditionally interested in, in that image of what STEM is, by integrating more of the arts and other fields and, uh, and more of an interdisciplinary approach, we can start reaching other kids who maybe didn't know that they were interested in, in robotics or coding or engineering. So I wanted to show a couple of examples of how you could do that. So the first thing I'm going to show you is the robot parts song and dance. So let me show that and then I will talk about it. So 
So I love that uh, song and dance because the kids were getting physical. We did this in a summer camp that we ran at DevTech and they were likening the parts of the human body to the parts of the robot that they explored. And you could create a similar song and dance for any of the robots that you might be using or exploring. Let me show you one more video. You put your robot in, you put your robot out, you put your robot in, and you do the hokey pokey and you turn yourself around. That's what it's all about. So in that video, we were doing the robot hokey pokey. And I love to show that particular clip because if you were looking closely at these little kiddos, it wasn't quite there yet. The robots weren't completely in sync. They weren't completely in sync. There's some timing issues. And so often we like to show the beautiful final finished product and we forget about that process, what Kim was showing earlier, the engineering design process. And we forget to celebrate the hard work and the hard fun and to showcase all of that. I do have a more polished version of the robot Hokey Pokey, but I don't like to show that one because I like this process video. And another great thing about this particular song, if you wanna to try to use it with any other robot that you might um, be using, is that there's a specific sequence to the steps. It's not just you know random dancing and shaking, which is also fun to program. You're forced to debug and problem solve if you want the dance to be coordinated and to do the actual hokey pokey. So it really reinforces this sequencing and that order matters piece of coding that also maps on to literacy and math and other domains as well. And lastly, I wanted to share before we jump in for Kim to talk about what she's been doing at her school, which is so exciting. One example of a totally low tech, no tech activity you could do back to these storybooks, like Kim mentioned earlier, we'll be talking about storybooks a lot. Kim and I love picture books to inspire the work that we do. But this was just an activity I did um, relating to solving problems that are in common stories or fairy tales that we read. And there's so many variations. You could do so many things with this. The pictures you see on screen are from my kids from a Saturday STEAM class that I taught in Lexington, Massachusetts. And they were building um, their own versions of the houses in the Three Little Pigs. So we did a couple of things. We did something where we built versions of the straw house using plastic straws, the stick house using popsicle sticks, and the brick house using Lego bricks. And we tested these against the Big Bad Wolf's breath, aka a fan with multiple speeds. So that was the engineering challenge. Um, can it withstand the, the highest speed on the fan, the, the biggest huffing and puffing of the wolf? And then we linked to a couple of other picture books as well. Um, if I Built a House, which is by Chris Van Dusen. Earlier, Kim mentioned If I Built a Car. Yeah, there's lots of books by this author that are super fun, rhyming and imaginative. And in that book, um, the characters dreaming about their, their dream house and what would be in it. And we also read a book, Dreaming Up, which shows different structures that kids can make with the objects that they have around every day and also the actual architectural structures that they that they resemble. So we use those two books to sort of spin off on building our dream houses and they did a lot of planning and blueprinting as you can see in the lower left corner. But once again, in order to have a challenge, so it wasn't just crafting, the, these needed to withstand the test of the fan once again. So this is really fun, um, hands-on, no screen, low cost activity that you could do. And you know, it's fun to do at home, but also in a school context as well. Awesome. Thank you, Amanda. And I've been watching the chat as you've been speaking and there's so many great ideas being shared. So we appreciate you all throwing your ideas into the chat. Um, it's so great to learn from one another. I know Amanda and I are both very active on Twitter as well. So I'm um, really looking forward to connecting with a lot of you beyond this webinar. I wanted to tell you just a little bit more about my school because I know a lot of times people think, and I used to think, well, you know, my students really can't do this or my population, this isn't going to need the meat meet the needs of my population. Um, Robbins Elementary is in a very rural area in central North Carolina. We have about 430 students. 88% of our students are on free and reduced lunch um, and 55% come from um, homes where most of the language is, is Spanish being spoken. So they're just learning English as they come to us. And what we have found is that in the last two years, um, making sure STEM is a vital part of creating a STEM identity in all of our students has really leveled the playing field. And we so appreciate um, a lot of the tools that we use in our 
um, STEM lab helping us with that. Um, if, if you're not familiar, Dash and the Blockly app um, translate into Spanish. The Dash will speak Spanish and that has helped a lot of our students um, that are just coming in that don't know English well. We have a language immersion program at Robbins in that um, students in the language immersion program from kindergarten all the way up through third grade now spend one day in the Spanish classroom, one day in the English classroom. So having tools in our lab that also speak Spanish um, is a wonderful um, thing that we have used in our in our new STEM lab as well. Um, we created a website because we wanted to be very transparent for our parents as well as our community to show what is going on in STEM. STEM is like an, a new vocabulary to many of the members of our community. We also wanted it um, to we wanted to be very transparent to the people who want to support our STEM lab. And so we did create a website and this is um, linked in our resources as well. So feel free to visit um, when the webinar is over. I wanted to show you a screenshot of a couple of the pages that we have on our website. Um, one of the most important being the engineering adventures. And this is where I just list out what we are doing each week in the lab so that parents can come and take a look. Um, it helps me to stay organized and look back and see what see what we've been working on, what we've been building on. And I always link my slides here that I use during my lessons. So feel free to visit this page and use the slides if you think they would help you in your classroom or your situation. We keep lots of pictures from the lab, um, again, to show growth over the year and throughout the last two years of, of all the activities that the students are doing. It's a great place for our parents to come and see what's going on in the school. We have a page where we um, thank uh, the grant providers. We've written many, many grants. As you know, funding is very tight, especially if you're a public school teacher. Um, and so we list you know, where we've gotten grants and how much they've been for and what materials we've purchased with those in a thanks publicly to our donors as well as um, to kind of show other people where they could go to get grant support. And then the last picture on this slide um, shows a form that I have on my website where teachers can just sign up. Um, a lot of times teachers will come through the lab and they'll see um, Dash and they'll say, you know, I really would like to use Dash with my students. I don't know quite how to use them. And we are going into a motion and force or animal um, habitats. And I really want to tie those two together, but I don't know quite how to do that. So they can sign up on this form and then we work together to design a lesson and either I teach it in the lab or they come in and co-teach or I model the lesson. So this has been a great tool for me to interact with my um, classroom teachers to support what they're doing with their curriculum as well as kind of help them integrate STEM. I'm gonna kind of skip over this video. This was a promotional video that kind of shows um, that we put out for our robotics competition that we hold every year. And it shows what we are doing in our STEM lab and really gives a great um, video about why we're doing what we're doing. So feel free, this will be in our resources as well. Feel free to take a peek at this video if you wanna see what goes on in the STEM lab at Robbins. But for time's sake, I'm just gonna skip over it because I would like to get to a couple of other things that I think would be really helpful as you're designing your STEM program or enriching your STEM program. Um, as we mentioned before, being a STEM lab teacher, I only have the students 45 minutes every other week. So it's hard for me sometimes to get through the entire design process and get to the improved stage. Um, and it's also hard for me to keep materials in the lab because I won't see the students until two weeks from the time that I have them. So what we've worked out with um, my media specialist and I have a great collaboration going on where she will a lot of times read the picture book that I want to use in my engineering challenges the week before I receive the students for STEM class. And what that does is provides time for the literacy and STEM connection to be made. So she's teaching a lot of the background knowledge. She um, is really working hard with the vocabulary. A lot of times she will have a, 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 a mini hands-on, like when they did the um, sink float, uh, the, the who sank the boat, she had done a sink and float investigation with them prior to them coming in after reading the picture book. Um, it increases exposure to the content vocabulary. As I said, a lot of our students are just learning English and um, as with any student, even if in English is their native language, exposure to content vocabulary in many different settings has been proven in research to be very helpful. So we find this a great way to, for them to see the vocabulary that they need in different settings throughout the school. And it also allows time for me to complete um, the most of the design process um, without having to read the picture book in addition to go through that design process. So that's just kind of one thing that's worked really well for us at our school. Um, this is a lesson that um, I wanted to share with you because it kind of it, it demonstrates that very 
thing. Um, the week before my students came in, my K2 kids, it was early in the year. They had not learned how to use Dash. They hadn't even seen Dash before. And in their classroom, their curriculum study was on animals and they happened to be including insects with that. And so the media specialist read to them, I'm trying to love spiders, which is a wonderful little picture book that has a lot of content in it, a lot of vocabulary about spiders and insects. Um, and then when they came into the lab, um, we had a big spider web, as you can see in the pictures, mapped out with electrical tape. And the little white papers are um, bugs that were in that had gotten caught in the web. And they were learning how to use the Go app for Dash. And to we passed the iPad around the circle, and they each got a chance to drive Dash for the very first time and be introduced to Dash and fall in love with Dash, as I'm sure you know if you have Dash, they all love Dash. Um, and if they could land on one of the insects, then they got to trade their card for one of the spider rings because who doesn't love a spider ring, especially if you're an elementary student. So these were our little kindergartners just learning the basics of robotics and tying it to the curriculum. Um, I also wanted to tell you about um, how we are using Dash for our robotics club. Uh, our county has always had a robust robotics program, like I told you, but it mostly was upper elementary through middle school, and it, it um, was designed around the Lego EB3 robots, which are the more robust, bigger robots. But as we started um, you know, using robots in the lower grades and making sure that we were including STEM and a lot of what we were doing at the elementary level, lower elementary level. We didn't want to leave those kids out. So we started creating dash clubs at our schools and including that as part of our annual robotics competition. We now bring dash clubs to dash um, teams to the competition, which is coming up on Friday for us. So in these pictures, you see um, them working on um, some of the challenges that they're going to do in the competition. And I really want to give a shout out to um, the um, Wonder League co robotics competition that um, Wonder Workshop holds. It's a free annual competition with Dash and Dot Robots, and it's for um, students who are age 6 to 14. And the wonderful news is that over 30,000 students participate. So it's exciting for your kids um, um, to register their teams and know that they're competing against students from all around the world on the same missions. Um, and the really cool part that goes with our webinar today is that 47% of the participants in this competition are girls. And so just like we're seeing at our school, Girls um, are just becoming, um, you know, very comfortable with programming robots and it's just um, part of, of who they are and they, um, you know, have a lot of meaningful conversation about them and are very good engineers when it comes to designing programs and ways to meet the challenges in the robotics competition. This particular one that's um, on this slide, the cups represent trash that had collected on the island. They had to not only program the robot to pick up the trash, but also engineer some kind of arms or plow that would stick out from Dash to be able to collect it all. So I will show you just a very short video so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. Um, and the students just love these challenges. And all of this mission content is available online if you want to try it out. We, a lot of times, pull down old missions from the older competitions and use it as training for our students. Oh, and, and the reason I love this video is you can see that there was failure there. And so one of the things that we really want to instill in our students is that failure is not a bad thing. Failure is just part of the learning and design and engineering process, and it's really through that failure um, that the greatest learning occurs. And so um, we practice once a week with our DASH teams and they are nominated by their teachers. That's just how we do it at our school. Um, students that may not get to go out for other things, they're not you know, the gifted students that are in the gifted program. Um, they don't go out for other activities, um, but they would really um, shine um, when, you, when you put robotics and coding in their hands. And so they will be competing this Friday. Another really exciting thing that I want to share with you quickly, because I know we're coming to the end of our webinar, is the Giga Girls After School Coding Club. This is a, a group that we started last year just for girls. They're in fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. They fill out an application every year to be a part of the group.
We meet every Tuesday for an hour. So you can see on the left is the first year's group. And then we expanded it to 16, 16 girls the next year because there was such demand for um, the girls to come to the club. They get to participate in lots of different coding every week. You can see we do Code Combat, which teaches basic Python, um, Scratch, which Amanda had mentioned, Scratch Junior. We, we use a lot of Scratch programming. Anything that is new that comes out, our Giga Girls get to um, kind of test out for us to see if we want to include in our lab. So when the Merge Cubes came out, they were the first ones to use them and, and test them out. But one of the most exciting parts of having the Giga Girls is that we have um, reached out to NC State University and we have matched them up each with a computer science major mentor who is a female. And so they each had a female mentor at the university level um, who would blog back and forth with them sharing um, tips and suggestions and our girls would share, you know, what they were doing in the club. And it became a very meaningful um, relationship that they built. This uh, is just a screenshot of one of the girls' blog posts from last year where um, she was telling her um, mentor, Anam, how she had been learning Scratch, and Anam responded that she was learning Scratch as well. And so Kaden just felt so empowered that her mentor, who is at the university studying computer science, is working in the exact same program she is working in. Um, we uh, feel it's very important, especially for our girls, to acknowledge struggle and that struggle is part of the engineering process. And um, when you have a, a mentor at the university level saying, yes, I struggle too, and here are some things I do to, um, to overcome that and keep with it, and I love what you're doing, um, just the confidence in our girls um, has been remarkable. This year, we decided instead of blogging that we were going to use Flipgrid. Um, which if you haven't used it, it's a video platform free to teachers. You can now that Microsoft bought it out, you can now, or sponsors it, you can now have as many topics as you want on your grid. So every week I will just create a new topic and the students create just 90 minute, uh, 90, excuse me, 90 second videos which is very manageable um, for our mentors to watch. So in this screenshot of a video, one of our gig girls is telling about how she had used Dash and Dash's launcher to um, complete a challenge. And you can see down below the little picture of her mentor because she had responded on her video. So that's how we communicated with the mentors this year. And then at the end of every year, we uh, last year we Skyped with the mentors, so the girls got to meet them through Skype. This year, just this past Friday, the girls got to travel to NC State University and meet their mentors and tour the campus. And it was just very exciting because now our girls have a vision of what the future can hold for them and, um, and know that it's a possibility for them and that there are girls just like them that are studying at the university level, something that they love as well. So that has been a really meaningful relationship. We've also done some global um, outreach where we were connected with a group um, in Mexico and the girls coded a computer program together, a game through Scratch, where they worked on the background and the coding with their partner in Mexico. So that was um, a really great global outreach. Here you see them working on their game. You can see on the right hand side, um, they exchanged videos with their partners through the Level Up Village platform. Um, every week talking about design and, and struggles that they were having. And so um, it was wonderful to Skype with them at the end and meet them face to face, obviously through Skype. Um, and the girls realized, you know, that there is much more to the world than just our small little town of Robbins and that kids all around the world are learning the same things they are. So we're really excited that the future um, for these girls is going to continue into middle school and high school, um, the high school they will feed into. 75% uh, of the robotics team members are girls and they have an all girls cyber patriot team, which is really exciting for our county, especially since we're in a, a not well populated northern end of the county, that these opportunities are available for our girls. So I wanted to share that with you as well. I think we wanted to just end with a few last tips and best practices. So uh, I think the tips that we have found over the last two years, especially, um, you know, conducting these in the STEM lab is starting young. Preschoolers can do much more than you think. And, and getting the girls having that STEM identity very young um, is working really well for us. Um, watch what they watch. Don't be afraid to talk about the stereotypes that we're seeing online or in picture books or um, in the advertising, you know, that they see every day. Providing good role models for them. 
um, promoting multidimensional interests. You know, it's okay to enjoy sports and enjoy coding. You don't have to pick one or the other. And then getting back to what I was just speaking about, acknowledging the struggle that it's, um, you know, it, you don't have to give up. There's going to be struggle in coding. There's going to be struggle in engineering and that's okay. And everyone faces it and we're just going to continue to work through it. And we've seen over the last two years that our students are much more able to um, get work through struggle and not give up than than before we had when we did not have the STEM program as it is now. And just remember, you know, it is important to expose students to STEM role models and, and women, engineers and scientists. But don't forget that you are also one of the most important role models, whether you're a parent, a teacher or an, any kind of educator. You are one of the most important role models and you have a huge impact on the way that kids see the world. So don't forget to model your growth mindset, to be transparent when you don't know something, to use it as a chance to show how you go about solving a problem and to most importantly model your own joy for learning STEM and learning in general, being a lifelong learner. If you still don't know where to start, we just want to suggest starting with a STEM themed picture book featuring female characters. And someone was mentioning in the chat earlier that it's important to to expose boys and make sure that boys are compassionate and caring. And I couldn't agree more. I'm a mom to an 18 month old boy. And so this is a topic that I'm really passionate about. Boys need to see these strong female role models in STEM and these characters so that they grow up to be a part of the change and not a part of the problem. And these are just a few of the picture books that Kim and I have used and that we love. And so thank you guys so much. I think you guys were talking a lot in the chat and we might have some questions, but that's all that we have prepared today. Here's our emails and our, our Twitter handles if you'd like to continue the conversation with us. So I see if we still have time for just a couple of questions, I see that somebody asked how many times per week they're coming to me. They come to me um, every other week for 45 minutes. Um, so, yeah, I don't see them on a weekly basis, but every other week. So in terms of well, there's another question about teaching coding in preschool, there's some great products that you can use. So, for example, the BeeBot that uh, Kim was mentioning, that's great for preschool level. There's no screens. It's colorful. It's totally tangible. The Kibo Robotics Kit is another great gender neutral tool that you can use as early as preschool. We've done research evaluating its efficacy with kids as young as four and the concepts that they were mastering. So Kibo is a great one for preschool as well. And I see a question um, about creating the lesson plans and, and relating it to the state standards. So we, um, at our school, we created a, um, an online collaborative document through Google Docs. And so every week when the students are in, the, or when the teachers are in their PLC meetings, um, they just put in what strands they're working on in a curriculum. And then all of the specialists have access to that. So I can kind of see what's coming up in the next week or so. And I can start pulling um, some, engineering challenges or robotics activities um, that I think might go along with the standards that the teacher teachers are going to be um, developing in the next few weeks. So that's a great way that we have worked on collaborating, collaborating and tying in the um, state's curriculum. And, and then I think one more person had a question about where they can start. Definitely check out the resource list that we're circulating because you can find all the books, curriculum ideas, research articles, all of the things that we mentioned in this presentation. You can take them right away and, and get started. And reach out to Kim and I if you would like to have some, you want to throw an idea by us or, or you want us to help you plan something. We're always game. Yep. Absolutely. And I see somebody else posted in here. Um, how can we collaborate with the Giga Girls? We would love to Skype with other girl groups or um, any way you want to collaborate. So you can reach me again through Twitter or through email. Please reach out. We would love to collaborate with any of you that are interested. It's been a wonderful, the Giga Girls have been, has been a wonderful experience for all of us. So thank you guys. I think we got a lot of the questions. If we missed any, please feel free to reach out to us via email on Twitter. It's been so fun chatting with you, learning where you come from, what you're doing with STEM, and it's just really inspiring and exciting for me. Me as well. Thank you so much. Hey everyone, this is Dylan Porterlance again from Wonder Workshop. So we're just going to be signing off here. If you have any more questions, like Amanda and Kim said, feel free to get in touch with them via Twitter, 
via email. We posted the resource list several times, um, but if you missed it, feel free to reach out to me at dylan at makewonder.com, um, and we can definitely help you out for anything that you're looking for. Um, it looks like one more person had a question, which was any advice for starting a Giggle, Giga Girl group at your school? Um, definitely, we posted a lot of resources in the in the resource list. Um, but Kim, maybe if you have one final note on that. Yes. Yeah, so um, in the resource list, there is a link to the application that we use. And so I would just start small. We started with a very small group. Um, we, you know, we we kept it to third, fourth, and fifth graders. But I would just start with a small group, see how many applications you have returned, and and then go from there. And feel free to reach out to me, and I can give you some more details on how we got our group started. I'd love to share that with you.